Welcome to Out of the Blank. to another episode of out of the blank podcast here with mr golden it's a pleasure to have you on the show would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening yeah my name is dan golden and i'm a journalist and author and i'm the author of spy schools which i think is the book we'll talk about today yeah because i came across it and like i said i've been kind of interested in the jfk topic and found that there was influence in academia from like fbi and cia and you wrote a book about it and i'm curious how did you come across you know writing about something like this well, I was working as a reporter at the time at, at uh, Bloomberg News, and I had done a piece about uh, something called Confucius Institutes, which are institutes that are funded by the Chinese government on campuses all around the world, including, you know, there at the time there were, I think, more than 100 in the United States. And people were worried that they were uh, expressing Chinese propaganda and that it wasn't healthy to have Chinese government institutes on American campuses. So uh, when I, ch I checked around, I saw that uh, there had been a uh, director of the Confucius Institute at the University of South Florida, who was a Chinese American named Dajin Pong. And he uh, had been fired from that job. And I noticed in a local clipping that when he was asked, uh, uh, why did you lose your job? Uh, he said, you don't understand, it all has to do with the FBI. And I contacted, uh, he was at the University of South Florida. I contacted USF and I said, you know, what is he talking about with the FBI? What do they have to do with the, him, him and the Confucius Institute? And uh, they said, oh, nothing. You know, I think he's just crazy. He's making it up. Uh, you know, if he was involved with the FBI, he wouldn't be talking about it. But then if, if, and he declined comment at the time. But a few years later, he contacted me and said he was ready to talk about it. And he provided some documentation. And that was the start of the book. And what, what it turned out to happen was the FBI had approached Professor Pong. They had, they had basically gotten information about him for various aspects of wrongdoing, financial finagling, things like that. And they said to him, you know, you've got two choices. You can lose your professorship and maybe go to prison for this wrongdoing we found, or you can keep your professorship and you can spy on your Chinese colleagues and on China for us. And so the book Part of the book tells the story of, of Pong and 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 this, but I got I wrote an article for Bloomberg about his experience, and then I was talking to a friend of mine who uh, was familiar with American intelligence, and he said, "Well, you don't understand. This happens all the time." He says American intelligence is always trying to recruit, uh, you know, foreign-born professors and students on American campuses to spy for us. And he said, then there are foreign students and researchers coming over from foreign countries who are spying for them. He said, there's a this kind of a covert spy war going on on American campuses. And, uh, you know, it's a two way street. And so I wrote a book, you know, I, I researched this for a couple of years. I wrote a book that basically half of it is about foreign espionage on American campuses and half of it is about American intelligence and the espionage that the recruiting it does of potential spies on American campuses. So, um, uh, you know, there is this kind of uh, conflict going on beneath the scenes at American campuses of, uh, you know, spy agencies, both American and foreign. Well, let me just get your perspective on, the, I would say, your issues on the foreign side of it. Like, what's what's the, the, the dangers? I'm, I'm guessing it's just propaganda. It's just steering. Like, I know a little bit about Confucius Institutes from speaking with Josh Rogan. Um, a little bit like learn about the CCP and a lot of those, but I mean, we do it over there as well too. So, I mean, same tactics across the board, maybe in different scenarios, but I mean, when it comes to our universities, when it comes to foreign propaganda, is there that big of a danger that there's just government or Chinese spies that are somehow getting into these institutions and brainwashing kids or making them think, I mean, it would, it would explain a lot the of issues. Issue, yeah. The issue isn't really brainwashing kids so much as it is uh, access to research. And also, you know, I mean, there is, Universities do a lot of classified research, 
And even some of the unclassified research they do is eventually going to produce classified offshoots. So you have the potential of uh, foreign intelligence agencies uh, gaining access to you know, important scientific research. The other aspect is that in America, we have kind of a revolving door between academia and government. So, you know, today's, uh, you know, full professor at Princeton is tomorrow's secretary of state. Today's secretary of state is tomorrow's full professor at Princeton, right? So by recruiting somebody, but it's a lot easier to recruit somebody in academia than it is when they're already in government. So by recruiting a student or faculty member in, in academia, you potentially have somebody who you can place in a government position uh, or a, a big position at the higher levels of American business where they have access to uh, sensitive information. So it's really, it's not so much straightforward brain. I mean, the, the Confucius Institutes, the propaganda is not really as big an issue as if there are, and I'm not saying it's true of the Institutes, but in general, efforts by foreign intelligence to gain access to uh, sensitive research and place people ultimately in recruit people they can place in important government or business positions. So is it like a, I would say a transaction here, like you get access to classified information, but with the objective of you're one day going to be working for as a spy or working for the government in some sort of way? Well, they would, you know, pay people. You know, so you 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 know you you get paid to. Well, it sounds like wagyu. It sounds like you're breeding a specific thing for a specific goal. There, that's the thing. Is like going into an institution. I, I mean, I don't know how close the relationships between universities are. With I didn't know they were looking through classified information as well, too. Yeah, universities have a lot of contracts with the intelligence agencies to do research. So let's say that uh, you know CIA or NSA or one of the other intelligence agencies. They want to do uh, research on, could be technology research. It could be research on sort of ways to uh, a- analyze networks. You know, they're always interested. If you, how do you build a picture of, say, members of a terrorist group? How do you identify them? How do you figure out the connections between them? This kind of research is often done at universities, and sometimes it's classified, and it would be of interest to uh, other countries as well. So there is that. You know, and on the American side, CIA and the FBI are interested in finding foreign students and professors who can go over to those countries and get the same kind of information and bring it back here. And that's why it's like I say, it's kind of a two way street. Now, did you investigate when this all started? Like, like I, I mentioned to you a little bit off air about the Fair Play for Cuba committee that Oswald was involved in. They had these Fair Play acts in many different universities, and there was these things called spotters. And, and I think particularly the school was Harvard or Yale that had people that would pluck people out and kind of, you know, would get them interested in like this kind of communist aspect of things. And I'm just curious because I know from like the Watergate scandal, a lot of the CIA's kind of acts got exposed in a way. And then I think people just thought that they were kind of diminished in power. But if I mean, I think you mentioned off air after 9-11. I mean, that means that they're still going and they're still doing these types of things, which in my sense, it looks like they never stopped. Well, here's the basic uh, history of it. Um, You know, this is very brief. I'll just hit a few items. But, you know, Obviously, the CIA was an outgrowth of the OSS in World War II. Then the CIA started after World War II. There was a heavy element of academia, right? A lot of people from the Ivy League, particularly from Yale, were instrumental in starting the CIA. And from the very beginning, uh, the CIA had very close ties to academia. And so there was a lot of uh, close connections where, uh, you know, professors uh, at universities, maybe they had CIA connections, they might recruit their students to work for the CIA or the FBI, and, and the intelligence agencies did a lot of recruiting on campus. Uh, they were very active, right? And this grew into, you know, a number of significant abuses. And uh, in, the, in the Vietnam and uh, Watergate eras, particularly in the late 60s, there was a big... Um, backlash against the FBI and the CIA, you know, the FBI had secretly, uh, you know, infiltrated civil rights groups and anti-Vietnam groups and had crossed the line in any number of ways. And so there was a big investigation of all this uh, led by what was called the Church Committee in the early to mid 1970s. And it came out with a report and its its findings included uh, sort of abuses of, of academia where, you know, professors with ties to the CIA were secretly recruiting foreign students who 
didn't know what they were getting into and, and so on. And uh, so this, the church committee put various limitations on what uh, spy agencies could do on campus. And then, um, and like I said, it, they got to the point where you, many universities did not welcome CIA or FBI recruiters or presence on campus. They were dead set against it, right? And if there was a recruiting event or whatever, there would be a lot of protests. So that lasted through the 80s and 90s. And then with 9-11, as you mentioned, um, there was a, and ever since, the, the CIA and, and FBI became more welcome again on campus. Um, universities, you know, the country became more patriotic after 9-11. After um, also, there was more money in it for universities because um, the, uh, you know, the intelligence agencies, uh, their budgets were ramped up and they were commissioning more research and so on. And so once again, uh, and there's, there's various university presidents who were active in this, the, the CIA and the FBI got a much freer hand again on campus. And, you know, that continues to this day. Um, and that's kind of why I wrote the book, because when I was a kid, you know, I grew up on a university campus, basically. My parents taught at uh, UMass Amherst. And I was very familiar with kind of how students and faculty didn't want the CIA on campus. And then I saw how much it turned around after 9-11. And so um, that was kind of, uh, I was interested in that that reversal. But yes, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of the uh, the history history of it. And I mean, what happened also in the last 10, 15 years is that university presidents, they became aware that the FBI and CIA were coming on campus sometimes without telling them. You know, they would they would go onto campus and they would go knock on the door of a foreign student or professor and try and recruit them and, and so on. And, and often the, the, the university administration had no idea. So the universities kind of said, well, you know, keep in touch with us, let us know, come through the front door and we'll help you if we can. And they set up a group called NSHEB, the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board, where the FBI and the CIA universities all, you know, talked together and the FBI and CIA briefed them on what they were doing. But of course, the problem was the FBI and CIA came in through the front door when it suited them, and they still came through the back door when it suited them. So it just made universities more vulnerable. And I don't think that NSHEB exists anymore. Maybe it's been recently revived. I'm not sure. I haven't followed it in the last couple of years. But um, in general, that mood still exists where universities are open to the intelligence agencies and the intelligence agencies will sometimes come on campus with full permission, identifying themselves and other times they're more secretive. I mean, what are your thoughts on the relationship between the universities and the government institutes? Like, I think it's a positive when you talk about like the 9-11 stuff, like the Patriot. I can get that opening up the door because, you know, you want to protection. Cybersecurity is definitely an issue today, you know, if you're doing that. But I mean, the tactics to get what they want. I mean, coming through the front door is one thing, but also coming through the back. I mean, if you mentioned someone in the beginning. I mean, if someone has debts, can you just use that against them? Like, hey, we'll clear your debts if you do what we want you to do. Like, it's not really asking at that point. It kind of it seems a little bit more forceful. Yeah, I mean, I'm not familiar with that particular tactic, but certainly, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff I exposed in the book that I wasn't happy about. I mean, to give you one example, uh, Harvard uh, has, or had at the time, probably still has a, a sort of mid-career program that I don't know, takes nine months or whatever. And you come into this mid-career program, it's like 75% foreign, 25% American, you know, you have rising businessmen and politicians uh, uh, and leaders from other countries, and they come to the Harvard Kennedy School, you know, which is their uh, foreign, foreign, foreign relations type school, government, government education type school. They come there in kind of a graduate program, and some Americans are in that program as well. And the idea is they'll all get together and they'll talk about their experiences and they'll gain perspective and they'll have good professors and you know, it fosters international amity and it, it helps people become ready to become leaders in their countries and so on. But one of the problems is that sometimes uh, the Americans in there are uh, CIA people, but they don't acknowledge it. So I found a bunch of people in the, who had been in the program who uh, actually were in the CIA when they were in the program, but they would use the cover they use over SVs. You know, I'm a uh, an attache in the embassy in Japan or wherever, but but they really weren't. They really were in the CIA. So that 
you know, you might be a foreign businessman and you come over and you, you know, you tell all your troubles and your issues to the to the classmate sitting next to you who you think is in the State Department, but they're not. They're in the CIA. And then, you know, then the CIA, you know, contacts you later overseas when they need you. Maybe they don't even say they're in the CIA then, but they develop a relationship. Maybe it becomes a financial relationship. Maybe that person becomes beholden to American intelligence. Um, they're compromised. So, so, you know, that's an example where, I mean, the defense would be, well, if the CIA person said they were in the CIA, then, you know, that would ruin their uh, cover for overseas. But why does the program have to take people from the CIA? It, could, it doesn't have to. It just does. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that I exposed in the book that, and at the same time, of course, in the Harvard Kennedy School program, there have been scandals where some of the foreigners in the program turned out to be spies without telling anybody. So, you know, you have no idea who you're sitting next to, really, which I guess is useful training. It's a bit like the real world. But my view is that academia should be kind of separate from all this. And when you're a student and you go to a university from a foreign country, you should be entitled to the idea that you're not going to be secretly recruited to join the, the American intelligence. You just go in there to get an education. And, uh, you know, so I think that, you know, it would be nice if academia was off limits, but uh, it's not. It makes me question more when I'm sitting next to another student and they're always talking about like recruiting, like, hey, you know, come join the army. The army sounds cool. I'm like, hey, I mean, are you a spy? Are you trying to get me to join the army? Uh, but that's that's insane. I, I like I, I guess my generation, I we don't think about that. We never I, like have you did you investigate like any of the top universities? Like what's the number of universities compared to the ones that accept the CIA or FBI compared to the ones that don't? Well, of course, Harvard's a top university in the and Yale, right? School is a top program. So that, you know, that was an example. I, I think it's, like I said, I think I think it's pretty common. One recruiting tactic, incidentally, that's used all over the world by probably American, certainly other intelligence services, is let's say you're a student at a university, maybe your professor maybe introduces you to a friend of his or whatever, and the friend says, you know, I could really use some research on this or that topic. Can you write me a paper on this topic? I'll give you $1,000 for a paper on... Uh, you know, U.S.-Cuban relations or something. And, you know, it doesn't seem to be any harm in it. You're a student, you need the money, you write the paper, you get the thousand bucks. Then, of course, the, the friend is actually in the intelligence service. If they, Then they'll ask you to do something. If you can't do something for them, if you say no, they'll say, well, you know, look, you're compromised. You know, you've been paid money by our intelligence agency. You know, we'll tell your home country that if you don't do what we want. You know, you can essentially uh, use use any payment you you that's made to somebody that's actually coming from an intelligence service as leverage to make them, you know, force them into spy, force them into intelligence work. And that that's a very frequent tactic. There was an American student in China who was uh, recruited there by an ad in the paper. You know, we'll pay you to write a paper on this or that. They paid him and he was uh, trapped. It's like not re it's like not reading the terms and services him back to try and get into American intelligence. I think, you know, he got caught. That's why we know about it. It was like the Glenn Duffy Shriver case. But it's that's a very that's a very common recruiting tactic. Now, with the idea of not disclosing that they're in the CIA, I mean, because I could say like a benefit if you talk about like I think NASA has a thing called citizen scientists where they bring in like for a convention or something, they'll bring in a bunch of people like you know, just regular students or something just to be able to look at a problem that they can't fix and come up with an answer for. And then they give them like some uh, prize or something like that. That sounded similar to like if you write a paper on Cuba and America relations. Maybe you'll see something through your, like I've read some really good scholarly articles where I'm like, this person deserves like an award and all this. Maybe that's what they're going for. But then there's that leverage aspect where it's like, well, you already accepted money from the CIA. So now you kind of have to do the other thing that I want you to do as well too. Yeah. It's just a pretext. They're not interested in what the paper has to say. It's just a way to make, it's just a way to pay somebody so that they're, you have them under your thumb. Now, it's not because they want it. It's not because they want your insights on U.S. Cuban relations. I wish. Um, but <laughs> did, did they do they not have to disclose it to any of the professors? I feel like if you have a CIA plant in one of your classes or something like that, it should be disclosed to your professors. Well, often in these cases, I mean, the, the professor is the one who brings in the CIA. Maybe the professor 
used to work there. They know somebody there. So they, they might be aware of it or they, or they might not be. You know, if you're an American citizen, you have more protections. I mean, I think that I forget the rules, but at some point, an intelligence agency has to acknowledge to you that they're CIA or FBI. They can't, you know, keep this deceiving an American citizen. But if you're not an American citizen, if you know you're a student visiting from, you know, Russia or China or the Middle East or wherever, um, you know, they can pretty much do whatever they want in terms of tricking you. I mean, that's a big hindrance that we have so many people that come over here from overseas, so many foreign exchange students that, you know, want to go here and go after what they call the American dream and stuff like that. And then you have them basically being convinced or groomed to be spies in a sense. Yeah. Again, like I say, it's going both directions. I also looked at this program in my book. There was uh, there's, there was a uh, college in Ohio. I'm, I'm, I believe it was Marietta. They had an exchange program with a, uh, a Chinese university, and it looked like a very above board thing. But actually, that Chinese university is funded by the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, intelligence ministry, I think it's security, uh, as well as the Department of Education, and it trains a lot of China spies. And it's kind of known as China Spy University if you're in China, if you're in the know. And so they were, but you know, Marietta just kind of looked the other way and, uh, you know, they wanted the the relationship and the, the revenue and so on, but, you know, the extra revenue brought in by the Chinese students. And um, so, uh, you know, that's, a, you know, that's an example of sort of Chinese intelligence, maybe making some forays under a, uh, under a guise. Now, when it comes to the lengths, I guess, of these intelligent are kids that could be picked up to be intelligent spies. I mean, are there is their job anything like just gathering information just from relationships or communications if they go over if they go back overseas, or are they gathering more spies and trying just to keep spreading and spreading and spreading? You mean Amer American students going overseas working for the U.S. or or foreign students that come over here and then end up becoming spies and having to get sent back? Well, as I said, I mean, uh, you know, it's their job would be to recruit other people, you know, and to um, possibly gain access to research and to find a job in a uh, agency or office or business that's of interest to the, the intelligence agency. You know, I, another case I looked at uh, was at uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. This was a number of quite a few years ago, uh, it was maybe the is 1980s. Maryland? Well, Johns Hopkins is in Baltimore, but the uh, SICE is actually in DC. It's a famous uh, international relations school. And they had a couple of students who were, uh, one named uh, uh, Marta Velasquez, I believe, as I recall her name, who was Puerto Rican. And she was quite sympathetic to uh, the Cuban cause. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of affinities between Puerto Rico and Cuba. And it's easier for Cuba to use uh, people from Puerto Rico because they're American citizens, you know, rather than, have, you know, we don't have a lot of Cubans coming to this country, or we didn't at the time, certainly as students. And so she was, uh, you know, secretly working for Cuba, and she recruited a classmate, uh, size named Ana Montes, who became probably the most effective Cuban spy ever in the, the U.S. She, she reached very high levels of the U.S. government. She oversaw U.S.-Cuban relations. Um, and she lasted a long time in that position, finally got caught and unmasked and sentenced to a, a lengthy prison term. But in Marta Velasquez then, of course, got outed. And, but she, um, she had married somebody from... Uh, Sweden, a Swedish diplomat, and uh, the U.S. She was indicted in the U.S., but she couldn't be extradited. So, actually, she teaches school in uh, Stockholm now. But uh, you know, so that's a case of Cuba using a you know Margarita Velasquez to recruit Ana Montes, who then becomes a top American official in Cuban relations. Would you say that 
it's most of the countries, I guess, the main powers that have these types of espionage acts, or is it just ones like, obviously China would be the biggest example and then us as well too, but like, is there influence from Russia? Is there influence from other institutions? I mean, Cuba can be one as well too. Oh yeah, Russian intelligence is active in the US. Um, you know, in addition to China, uh, you know, uh, Taiwan, you know, in addition to the to mainland China, you know, uh, they they have intelligence activity in the on, on U.S. college campuses. Um, quite a few countries, you know. It's, uh, I mean, I don't have every single one documented, but I would say that any major country would be seeking, uh, would have a seeking a presence in American academia. Now. Does the universities only have agreements with the FBI or the CIA, or do they have agreements with other institutions from other countries, like just other intelligence institutes? I mean, maybe it's not guys as the way it's like, hey, we're going to send some spies over to you, but maybe it'd be like, hey, we have some people that want to collect information and have them sent, you know, an agreement with the university to do so. Well, an American university is not going to, I mean, they don't look, they don't have, I mean, like I say, they have this group, they had this board where they talk things over with American intelligence they're not going to have any formal agreement with a foreign intelligence agency. I mean, that that would be uh, highly problematic. <laughs> but, you know, what they do do is they look the other way because, see, they have a financial motive because they look the other way on the CIA and FBI because they get all those research grants, as I mentioned, from American intelligence. With foreign countries, you know, American universities, and this was more true a number of years ago, but it's still somewhat true. I mean, they want branches in foreign countries, right? Their students want to go overseas for a year. So they want to, you know, I mean, there was a time when every American university wanted to open a campus in China, right? And they wanted the, the goodwill of the Chinese government. And they see this as a big revenue making opportunity. I mean, if you open a, a campus in, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the Gulf states or the Middle East or, or you, you know, you'll get Local, you get new alumni who will donate. There's rich people there who will subsidize the building of the campus. The students will pay full tuition. Plus, you get, you know, sort of reputation as a world university. So American universities have a lot of reasons to be on good terms with foreign countries, right? Not only their professors go to conferences there, but it's, it's you know, a lot of it is about we've got campuses overseas. We have, you know, we want our students to have overseas opportunities. So it's not really in their interest to be looking for Chinese spies on American campuses or, you know, spies from any other country because they want a presence in those countries. They want to be in good terms. So they don't want to alienate the CIA or the FBI uh, and they are the other American intelligence agencies. They don't want to alienate foreign countries unless they absolutely have to. You know, they don't want to kick the student out of, uh, uh, you know, and, and make a big deal, say we're expelling you because it's espionage. You know, they'll they'll give the, uh, uh, you know, they'll give the person a degree anyway and kind of look the other way. It's, you know, it's not our business. So that's why this one reason it goes on is because universities have a lot of financial motives to uh, to have it go on. So even if one's caused, it's not really even a punishment, kind of just, you know, look the other way and kind of send them over just because you have too much, I guess, financially invested into the people that are funding you. Yeah. So and they probably don't want the bad publicity, but it's mostly a financial thing. So, you know, they they look the other way in general. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, totally I'm, really... I'm trying to understand this. Is like because I would have think that somebody would have exposed this at all. Like I, I, besides you, but I mean, like it would have been like a major news headline or something like that. Like institutions being. I haven't seen anything like that before. This is all new to me. Yeah, I mean, I was interested in writing about it because it's below the surface and nobody had really looked at it. You know, not very much. I mean, I, I did do this. One of my chapters was about a, a graduate student from China who came to Duke and essentially stole a lot of cutting edge uh, research on invisibility, how to make buildings invisible and ultimately weapons. You know, there's, 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 there's scientific research on invisibility. And this guy came over and, you know, it was never conclusively proved, but there was a lot of, he did a lot of suspicious things. You know, he brought over other Chinese scientists who photographed the equipment and he seemed to take some research kind of appropriate research data and so on and you know my, my memory is you know and then he went back to china and started a company that worked in this area became a billionaire but um you know 
he i mean duke still gave eventually they locked him out of the lab because they were concerned about you know he was stealing the research but uh, i believe ultimately they gave him a doctorate anyway and uh you know he i don't think he's come back to the u.s since he probably wouldn't be adv well advised to do that but essentially he got away with it so i have a chapter about that and that got some attention there was some network news uh you know were you more surprised that they were working on invisibility I wasn't that familiar with it. And so that was quite interesting and kind of a sexy part of it. <laughs> Apparently there's ways that you can make certain kinds of waves go around the object that you're looking at so it doesn't appear. And it was, uh, the professor was very helpful. He was very chagrined that he had kind of been too naive and overlooked what were pretty obvious signs of intelligence activity on the part of this graduate student. Did you and, uh, did you ever look into the paranoia aspects and all this? I mean, if this is more well known, probably with some of the professors or something like that. I mean, I don't. If, if kids are paying to go to school, this should be disclosed that hey, we're going to let the intelligence agencies. You know, there might be some people in here, you know, recruiting or doing some spying tactics. I get they can just not disclose it to people, but I mean, the amount of paranoia. I mean, if you just talked about that professor, imagine what he's got to think every time he sees a student come into his class. Now he's going to be a little bit less trusting on who he's let's you know stay in the lab after hours or maybe look at information or share crucial data points onto something yeah i think he is going to be uh i mean i think he is probably more more skeptical and of course the, the, these were graduate students obviously but yeah i mean i think he's more careful in his selection of graduate students he he gave uh he the i found out about it because i sent in a public records request to the to this uh group I mentioned, the National Security Higher Education Advisory Board, and they mentioned that they had had, you know, in the, they sent me their agendas of their meetings, and one of them was, you know, a professor at Duke University talks about how he was, uh, uh, you know, tricked into allowing, uh, you know, somebody appear to be from Chinese intelligence access to, you know, very cutting edge uh, research. So, and then I, I figured out who the professor was and I, 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 I researched, I talked to the other people who had been in the lab and, and so on. But yeah, I mean, obviously there's gonna be some mistrust. Now, paranoia, I mean, I would say this guy's, I wouldn't call him paranoid because he's got reason to be anxious about it, right? And, and I mean, you know, I don't think he's thinking that every student he takes is, is gonna be a, you know, work for an intelligence agency. And of course that wouldn't be true. I mean, the vast majority of foreign students are not working for intelligence agencies and the vast majority of professors are not connected to the CIA, you know, but these things do happen. And like I said, they happen in both directions. And it would be good if colleges acknowledge this and people were aware of it, but, um, you know, they don't really acknowledge it. I mean, I wrote another book about college admissions. It's kind of the same way where, college, you know, my book was about how uh you know wealthy tycoons and 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 you know billionaires will give millions of dollars to an elite university when they're around the time their kid is applying in order to get the kid in and um i mean that's true but you don't see universities talk about that when they talk about college admissions they don't say here's our you know here are our requirements for college admissions you have to have you know good grades good scores we want a recommendation and it would help if your pie if your father's a a billionaire and gives us $10 million. And they just don't say it, but that's the way it works, you know? But so it's the same kind of thing where colleges, they don't like to, um, you know, unlike like any industry, I guess, they don't really like to talk about the seamier side of their business. And, you know, I'm an investigative reporter specializing in higher education. So that's what I, that's the kind of stuff I dig up. Why did you choose higher education to get interested into, if you could investigate anything? Well, of course, I mentioned I grew up, uh, you know, my parents were both professors, so I was interested. And then um, it was just happenstance where I happened to be looking for a job. I was uh, had been at the Boston Globe. I wanted to go somewhere else. And the Wall Street Journal had an opening for somebody to cover education. And I had done a series at the Globe about Harvard and some of the underside of things that were going out of Harvard, not, not to do with admissions or intelligence, other stuff. But so I said, okay, I'm an education reporter and the journal hired me to cover that beat. And so that's when I, and, and I think, you know, I was familiar with how higher ed works from the inside because of my family background. And, uh, you know, I had a good sense of both public and private education because my parents were faculty at a public university. I went to Harvard, which is a private university. 
So I felt comfortable in that world. And uh, it wasn't that hard to develop sources. And, uh, you know, I've been writing about it off and on ever since. You said it wasn't hard to develop sources, but like, how hard was it for you to get this information at least disclosed throughout your book? Like, did, did you get, like records? Like, I wouldn't even know what to look for. I mean, did you have a key start of where you wanted to go and where you wanted to look? And then were they openly giving you these files or did it take like a year or so, a couple of years? Well, some of this was pretty hard and it did actually, it did take, you know, I mean, if you include the time I spent on that initial story about the guy in South Florida, it, it took, you know, several years. And uh, I mean, you know, there were key people along the way who helped me, who pointed me in the right direction. You know, you you need to get these documents or whatever. And then I did one uh, thing that was uh, worked well, which is, um, you know, if you send a public records request to the CIA, you know, you can get wait many years and they'll never give you the information. I mean, once in a while they will, but it, they don't exactly leap to comply with public records requests. I've been, right? I mean, I've been rejected twice already, so I got you. Pretty secret agency. So if you ask the CIA for their communications with, you know, universities, you get nowhere, right? But instead, I, you know, but public universities are also subject to Freedom of Information Acts. And they're, you know, they believe in sharing information. I mean, you know, they're a university. So um, rather than waste a lot of time on, on records requests to the CIA and the FBI about their interactions with universities, I sent out a lot of records requests to state universities, send me your uh, communications with the CIA and the FBI. And that proved much more fruitful. I got a lot of documents from these public, public universities because, you know, and that's where I got these agendas of the National Security Higher Ed Advisory Board. You know, the universities that were, were, whose presidents were on that board would communicate back and forth and they would have the agendas of the meetings and so on. And so, you know, one the key thing, you know, one key move I made that worked was sending public records requests to state universities for their interactions with intelligence agencies. And, you know, that was kind of a very good. And then for the one about Harvard, the Kennedy School, um, I went and I looked at all the, uh, for that program, I looked at all the sort of yearbooks of that program. And you would, you know, you could go, somebody tipped me off that, some of the people in the in the program were, um, you know, in the CIA but hadn't disclosed it. And you could go back through this these programs of graduates, and you could pretty much easily identify who somebody was, you know, who was in the CIA based on, you know, they would list the languages they spoke and the kind of jobs they had, and if it's like economic or political attaché, speaking Farsi and so on. It's like, well, this person is a pretty good candidate, and then I would call them up, and you know, years had passed. Some of them had left the CIA and they would just tell me, yeah, I was there undercover and, you know, and so on. And so, um, you know, I, I got half a dozen of them or so to tell me their experiences. One guy who was in the program under, um, you know, some cover had died in a, in a mountain climbing accident. And when he died, his obituary talked about how he was one of the you know greatest CIA agents of all time. And so I kind of built the chapter around him. And, uh, you know, and talk to his his classmates. Did they know that he was in the CIA? I mean, they saw the obituary. They were surprised on two counts, right? A, that he was dead and B, that he had been in the CIA because, you know, they, they didn't know it. He didn't say it at the program. So, you know, so that was the kind of reporting I did there. Um, you know, as I mentioned, that the professor at Duke was cooperative for the for the invisibility chapter. And, and that was a, that was a big help. Uh the the uh, the woman from Puerto Rico. I spent a lot of time on the phone to Puerto Rico, talking to her, her father had been a, a judge, and talking to people who knew him and knew the family. And I I uh, worked with a, a reporter in uh, Sweden who went to who helped track down that it was this, the Marta Velasquez in in Sweden was the same person who was the uh, under indictment on you know intelligence related charges in the, in the U.S. So that that took a while. Uh, I, I got her 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 senior thesis at Princeton, I think it was, which was very effusive praise of Fidel Castro. So that was helpful, you know. So um, there's a lot of different ways I used to work on it, and uh, but you know those those you know all kinds of documents, and then just trying to find the right people to talk to. 
I'm wondering how, like, how much information did you get out of these documents? And then like, what did you have to cut? What did you choose to cut to put in certain chapters to make it fit? Well, see, it's got 11 chapters and an introduction. And uh, the first half is called Foreign Espionage, Espionage at American Universities. And the second half is called Covert U.S. Operations in Higher Education. So you can see I look from both sides. One of my, one of my uh, proudest things is that you know who John le Carre is, the great spy novelist? Uh, he wrote the book, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Have you ever heard of that? He's probably... Uh, He's, he was a famous writer of spy novels like uh, Tinker, Tailor, Soldier, Spy. I mean, there have been the many movies and TV series have been made out of them. And he was one of my heroes. Anyway, he liked the book and he he wrote a blurb for it. So that was uh, uh, that was a big, uh, very pleasing thing. John John Le Carre. It's a pen name. It's not his real name, but uh, he he's since passed away. But but uh, that was great. And. Uh, Yes, yeah, so there's a chapter about the invisibility. There's a chapter about the Marta, Marta Velasquez in Cuba. There's a chapter about that Glenn Duffy Shriver case I mentioned. Uh, you know, there's there's the one about the, the Kennedy School. Uh, there's probably some other case studies. Um, there's the one about the college in, in Ohio, I'm sure. Let me see, what was that chapter called? Uh, uh, foreign exchange that chapter was called as you, you pointed out um so uh you know so these are as i've mentioned you know so these are some of the case studies in the book that i think make it an interesting read i mean it's it, it definitely has piqued my curiosity i mean like i said i did not know anything about academia and this relationship with the government i mean when you created your book and you were releasing it did you did any giant media outlets really hook onto it and blast it over? Or was that just a story that just, cause you said you were looking for stories that slipped under the radar that were kind of underneath the surface. And I feel like there's a reason it's gotta be underneath the surface. I don't think people want to expose a lot of this a university relationship with the government. And also it leads down a deeper road too. I mean, I, if I can't, making sure I don't get this wrong, but not too long ago, Harvard made it harder for Asian students to get into school. I think they changed the requirements of like the IQ averages. They raised them up higher because they had too many Asian students. Do you remember a story about that? Yeah, that, that's not quite what happened. Uh, what, what, I mean, there's a uh, affirmative action lawsuit going on, right, against Harvard, well, where the allegation is that uh, uh, it, 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 that it, um, holds Asian American students to a higher standard, you know? And so uh, it really, and they're blaming affirmative action for, uh, you know, African Americans and la Latinos, but uh, regardless of the merits of that suit, some information came out in that lawsuit showing that uh, uh, Harvard uh, rated Asian American applicants low on various personality traits, which seemed kind of stereotyping or racist and that this seemed to be a way to uh, admit fewer Asian Americans because they didn't, you know, there was only some, and in fact, my admissions book has a chapter on the treatment of Asian Americans in college admissions, not this book. Uh, but uh, essentially for many years, Harvard, uh, the percentage of Asian American students at Harvard never exceeded 20%. It was always pushing up against that. It seemed like kind of an informal quota. And this lawsuit uh, is alleging you know, you're holding higher standards for Asian Americans because you let in, uh, uh, you know, Blacks, Hispanics of lower standards. Now, my own viewpoint, I don't agree with that lawsuit. My viewpoint would be, yes, they do discriminate against Asian Americans, but the real problem is they reserve so many seats for, uh, uh, you know, wealthy but underachieving white students, you know, because they're rich and they they come in under legacy preference, which is the preference for alumni children, or development preference, which is just the preference for somebody who, whose parents are likely to donate a lot of money. So, but anyway, that's what this is. But that's not really related to the intelligence issue. That's all, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, intelligence has two meanings, right? It's related to intelligence in terms of IQ tests or whatever, but it's not related to, you know, espionage intelligence. Well, I meant that's the worst I've ever heard about a university so far. Oh, I see. Yeah, I mean, I know. Yeah, that was very disconcerting, that information that uh, they, they were rating people from a particular background lower on personality, and it was not good.
Well, we, I, mean, I think there's that movie stereotype of my daddy could buy this school or something like that. But I mean, that's kind of how it is. You got a lot of kids that are getting in just because their parents supply a certain amount of money to make them go to that school or help them get their admission in. And then also, I mean, government employees as well, too. I mean, how easy is it for a chief of a military to be able to get their student in a certain college as well? Yeah, I mean, there's a benefit to celebrities, rich people. If you're a state university, children of state legislators, you know, so that, yes, there's a variety of, it's uh, many different routes to get into a college. But anyway, um, so anyway, so get, getting back to the spy schools, but those are some of the case studies I looked at. And uh, I think, you know, I think it, it, now, one of the things that, you know, it, it, it didn't sell as well as it could have. And I think one of the reasons was it came out sort of right after, uh, you know, Trump was elected and, and uh, you know, not that long after. And, and he was, at least in his rhetoric, was very against having foreign students. He tried to reduce the number of foreign students from various countries and stuff. In my book, you know, it's really about the era of globalization when, uh, you know, we were, every year there were more and more foreign students and professors coming. Every year, American universities were opening more campuses overseas and sending more students overseas. And so basic big picture in my book was overall globalization is a good thing. We should be very international in our outlook. But there is this downside for universities that you have this, you know, conflict between American and foreign spy agencies and and students being treated as pawns and kind of being exploited, you know, researchers and being, you know, unwittingly recruited. But the book came out in an era when it seemed like globalization was kind of receding, you know, because Trump was more of a, you could call him an isolationist, right? At least in his rhetoric. So it didn't quite fit the time. Of course, now Biden is president, right? He's an internationalist and we're back to globalization, except that the pandemic made it difficult for you know students to be moving from you know their home country to the US and from the US to other countries and so on. So so between Trump and the pandemic, the conditions where what I was writing about was kind of a fever pitch of not quite you know returned. I mean now that the pandemic seems to be slowing down, I mean I think we will be going back to a time of you know where globalization is kind of uh you know in vogue once more. Maybe that'll bring my book back to be in vogue again, you know, but that's kind of like Sometimes when you write a book, factors beyond your control affect sort of how how much attention it gets. And, you know, like I said, I think if let's say Hillary Clinton had been elected, you know, she would have continued with the sort of globalization approach. And my book probably would have been more timely. If there was another area in higher education, um, what would it be like you focused on admissions, then you focused on the, I guess, influence of, you know, espionage, I would say, or just in academia in general, what would be another area for you that you would maybe investigate into of higher education? Well, I mean, the, right now, in a way, I think the biggest issue is probably academic freedom, because, um, you know, conservative groups in Florida, places like Idaho, Oklahoma, places like that, are sort of attacking uh, and, and pressuring and passing laws about what, you know, these universities can teach on certain controversial subjects like race. You know, they're attacking the, you know, critical race theory, which has been around for 40 years as a way to think about, you know, systemic racism in American institutions. All of a sudden, you know, they're trying to ban people from talking about it or teaching it. I'm not a big believer in the government, you know, trying to tell universities what to teach or legislators. I mean, it kind of smacks of the McCarthy period, right, when they went after professors for being uh, supposedly having communist affiliations and, you know, the red baiting era. We seem to be kind of in another era like that, where academic freedom is threatened by people, you know, trying to you know, change curricula and try to influence what professors say in the classroom and the attitudes they take. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in academic freedom. And so, which is just like, I don't want the government in, intruding on universities by, by infiltrating spies, right? And by recruiting, secretly recruiting students. I also don't want the government intruding on universities by telling them what to teach. And so uh, I think that that is a, uh, and, and, you know, and it's a very important for universities to stand up to this pressure and not give in. 
And because state universities in particular, they get a lot of their funding from state legislatures or some of their funding, um, they're scared, you know, and they, they, there's the danger that they will just roll over and cave and fire teachers who who say things that the unit legislature doesn't like. And, you know, once you have that, you, you know, your academic freedom is gone and, you know, a really bad situation. So I think that's probably the number one issue for higher education now. Are we are we back in a McCarthy-like period where governors and legislators and, and politicians are trying to dictate to universities, you know, what can you teach and what can't you teach? I would say there's a bigger encroachment as well, too. I mean, it's the lesser of two evils in a sense. I'd rather have the government there than big business because somehow big business has this weird funded in a lot of research from the plenty of academics I've talked to. They've always mentioned that there's this issue where they're taking their money from one stakeholder and it's not the government. It's just a business corporation that's funding their research, whether it's AI or something like that. And it's like, I don't want any of that in academia. I'd rather at the free range of letting academic research, whatever the hell they want to research, and let them have the money to be able to do so. But it's just not how it works. Yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, and I mean, I think that's a particular issue with places like medical schools where you have pharmaceutical companies guiding the research in certain directions. But, you know, at least businesses don't really care what you teach about issues like race relations. You know, so so in the sort of the issues that the right wingers are now attacking, um, business is not playing a big role there. You know, it's really uh, the government. And but I agree with you, business can be a, can be a, a, a danger, too. You know, and, uh, you, you know, there's a there's always the potential for conflicts of interest where, you know, your research is, you, you know, you're doing medical research or whatever, and it's tainted because it's funded by a certain uh you know, drug maker and they Mom want Santos. Their, they want or whatever. Yeah, they they want their clinical their read the research to put a better light on their product. And that's always a worry too. I, I agree. That that's that's a concern too. I would say right now though, I mean that's kind of perennial concern right now, this attack on academic freedom by in, in red states is 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 a paramount homeschool. Concern. Homeschool university. That's the best university. The only influence is your parents. Right, right. Well, could be. Uh, I should run, but this yes. is Mr. Very, Golden. Very please, good. where can people find your books, man? Right. Thank you very much. Where Where can people find your books? Well, where can they find my books? Yeah. Well, you know, they can read them on Am Amazon. You know, you can find it anywhere online at Amazon, or uh, that, that's probably the best place. Or you know, I mean, check your local bookstore too. You got a Twitter? Uh, I'm on Twitter, but I mean, I don't sell my books myself, you know what I mean? But they can certainly follow me on Twitter. Uh, I, I forget my Twitter handle. I'll put it in the link. I follow you. Yeah, I'm in there, you know, yeah, put in a link and, uh, you know, I'm on Twitter and I'm, uh, Facebook. I don't use it much, but I'm, I'm on social media, but I mean, I, I would order it on Amazon. It's probably the easiest thing to do. Well, I'll link your Amazon links for your books and also link all your social links as well, too. It's been a pleasure chatting. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.